In this lecture on chapter six, I'm going to go through a variety of different material laws, so-called constitutive laws, which are used in the second half of the second half of the book um, in the tutorials. These are probably the most important material laws um, and give a reasonable introduction to this topic. The presentation is in three parts. I'd like to first of all talk about um, or present a variety of different rheological models, which are simplified ways to present constitutive behavior of materials and to give a general introduction, the typical sort of material models that are available in Calculix and also in other finite element codes. I'll then move on and cover elasticity for 2D and 3D materials including isotropic, orthotropic and anisotropic behavior. And then lastly, I'll move on to nonlinear materials. There are many possibilities here, but I, I, I'm only going to focus on hyperelasticity and plasticity. Many materials can be characterized with these simple rheological models. They're basically 1D representations of material behavior and you use simple elements like, like this spring here to represent stiffness, or this dash pot here to represent viscosity. And there's another element on the, on the next slide that we'll see, which represents friction. That's the sort of thing that could be used in plasticity models, for example. But mixing these together, you can, you can represent a lot of different material behaviors. And they're useful just for characterizing materials and for discussing how the behavior of materials is. The first one shown at the top there is very simple linear elastic behavior. Very simply extending it, the material has a linear relationship between stress and strain, and that will continue until some kind of um, critical point is reached, perhaps where you might have another phenomena take place like plasticity or damage. Another group of materials are nonlinear elastic, shown here. In this case, the stiffness, E, is a function of displacement. This then gives us this nonlinear behavior for the elasticity. We still regard the material as elastic if it unloads in this direction along the same curve as the loading. There are, however, many other materials like foams where the unloading will take a very different path down here. This is a hysteresis. It may come down to this particular point here. It could with time move towards the or origin again. And if you reloaded, it would come up a similar sort of path up to this point again and then continue on in this direction. The, there are other types of foams, however, where you might have crushing taking place. In, in this case, you would come up a curve, something like this, until some particular point where crushing does occur, and that behavior is more like plasticity then it would continue along here and any unloading would come down a very well-defined curve to a fixed permanent strain. The model as I've drawn here wouldn't, wouldn't be suitable for representing that, um, but on the next slide we, we, we can see some behaviors that would be more, which would be more representative. The next behavior here that I've shown is viscous behavior. In this case, you have a relationship between stress and strain rate, where this is the viscosity of the material characterized by this dash pot. This could apply for many polymers. They have a very stiff behavior, but then at some point, as molecular structure starts to move, stretch and move over each other, then you get a um, a relaxation, if you like, a deformation behavior of the material. It is strain rate dependent, so it depends upon the rate of loading. 
And you can see that here at a very low strain rate, at a, it will deform at a low stress. And then as you increase the strain rate, then you need, um, you will get higher stress, um, a more um, a stiffer material behavior, if you like. This is shown to be perfectly plastic. Are these straight lines. You could, however, have some kind of hardening curve. In that case, you would include a parallel spring in the system. So the starting for the movement, if you like, the stretching changes with strain rate. And then once it starts to move, the spring will be deforming and you'll have some kind of a stiffness behavior. Of course, you can modify this spring to make this E value a function of displacement. In that case, you could characterize some other behavior. Four variations of plasticity rheological models are shown on this slide. The first one at the top here introduces a kind of friction element which would provide a rigid connection until a certain stress is reached. In this case, once, once that stress is reached, you would then have a situation of pure plasticity, pure perfect plasticity. The spring, this element would in fact have then sliding if unloading occurs at any particular point or you stop loading, then you would uh, come down here and you would have a permanent plastic strain within the material. If reloading occurred, then you would have to come up here and continue in this direction. The next one is elastic, perfectly plastic. So as you move on to many metals, you will have a certain elasticity for the material behavior up until some yield point, at which case this element breaks and you would then have perfect sliding occurring. The spring shown there would no longer extend. If unloading occurred or you stopped loading, you would come down here. This slope would be parallel to the initial loading slope and you would have permanent strain in the material, plastic strain, and this would be the amount of plastic, uh, elastic strain in the unloading that would occur. If we move on one step further, and this represents many, many materials, um, you would have a situation of, well, this, this element and this element would give you the same behavior as the previous. In other words, you would come up here and then you would move in this direction. But we've added an, an additional spring in parallel with the friction slider. And this provides the hardening modulus for the material. If you were to make this a function of displacement, or better said, if you made it a function of strains, then you could, you could have some kind of a curved relationship here. Unloading would again be parallel to the initial loading curve. This would be your plastic strain and this would be your elastic strain. And again, this, this friction breakage that occurs here, the sliding starts once you reach a yield stress for the material. And finally, we could add dynamic effects, strain rate effects by using the previous rheological model here, but adding this damper. This is viscous strain rate dependent, so it depends upon the speed in which the loading occurs. You have all the features of the previous model, except now you can have an additional sh shift in the hardening due to strain rate. And that is, that is, that is captured by this viscosity model, which is strain rate dependent. Again, you could unload down here. This would be your 
plastic strain, this would be your elastic strain. There are variations of these um, hardening models for real materials, but some of the key features are shown here. It was not really a focus of mine in the tutorials in the part two of the book to, to explore all the material models that are available in Calculix, but I, I have tried to apply a number of them. And on this slide, I just wanted to show you the different ones I have used. The tutorials themselves were explained in the preamble and a little bit more in the lecture on, the lecture on video seven. I've listed here though, on the right, the uh, material models that are applied. I just wanted to go through them. The first and second use 2D and 3D orthotropic elasticity. This is for tackling composite materials. Calculix is not very strong on composite materials, but you can, you can do orthotropic and even actually anisotropic elasticity modeling. In lecture three, I went on and used an elastoplastic von Mises model. In this case, I used it for representing elastic plastic behavior and of an adhesive material, but you can use it and, and what it's really designed for is metals. Tutorial four was using a purely isotropic elastic model. Tutorial five was a thermomechanical analysis, which is basically showing the coupling between temperature and mechanical behavior. I should say here in, in many of these models, you can actually have a proper uh, temperature dependence of the mechanical properties. And, and in fact, on the real, real logical models I was just showing you, the modulus, for example, could be temperature dependent. In temperature, uh, in, in tutorial six, we used permeability for a fluid flow problem. Seven, eight, and nine was again using mixtures of or variations of elastic and elastoplastic behavior. Also in tutorial 10, which was an explicit analysis that was purely elastic. In tutorial 11, I tried to use a, a hyperelastic material that's available in Calculix. There are I think five or six variations of hyperelastic materials available for modeling polymers. There's also a hyperelastic foam material model available. And in the latter tutorials, it was viscous fluid flow, but using a different code. So there was a, a fairly good variation of uh, variety of material models used. I thought it might be interesting just to have a look at um, other codes though. Calculix is not particularly strong on constitutive models. It's got a, a good variation and certainly enough for, for any kind of teaching purposes. But if you move on to some of the commercial codes, then I would say over the last 20 years, one of the emphasis has been development of material models. And I've listed key types of material models available in the code LS Diner. This is probably one code with the, the, the most models actually, because it's, it's used by a lot of uh, research people, universities and industry. You'll, you'll see there the list, we've got elasticity, elastoplasticity, but there will be a lot of uh, variations of this for modeling different types of metals. There are failure models, this is not something that's really possible in uh, Calculix, but uh, some of the other codes have quite sophisticated models for representing failure. And although I've said metal failure there, of course, you could apply that to, uh, to other types of materials as well. Memory shaped alloys, polymers and adhesives, hyperelastic models. Again, there will be many variations of hyperelastic models. I will be going through some of these later on in this particular tutorial. And some of these would also be used for specialized rubber materials. Honeycomb materials, that is a kind of, uh, how shall I describe it, it's a, a sort of tubular structure. 
with um, uh, very particular crushing and stiffness properties in each direction. There are a lot of different varieties of foams used in industry, closed cell foams, crushable foams, some foams where the air is really moving through the material as it's being deformed. And there are a variety of models available in Elastina. You have concrete, soils, fabrics, glass, all of these will have their own material model. There's a special model for John, a Johnson Cook model for strain rate dependent failure modeling of metals. In composites, you have about six or seven different material models available. And then there are some really special applications for modeling human tissue and muscle and so on. A code like Dyna will have three or four or maybe even more variations of model for each of these types of materials. And it's very difficult to, to give any particular recommendation. I suppose the best is to try and use the most recent implemented, assuming that it's an improvement on the previous ones. Ideally, the previous models should be removed from a code, but this is, this is not really very easy. The problem is that um, customers may have data sets that are quite old and they still expect these data sets to work um, at some time in the future. So it is rather difficult for commercial codes to, to remove the models. Can be make, can, can make life very confusing for a new user to a code. There's a link at the top there if you want to look at the in more detail at the models that are available in Dyna, for example. I'm going to move on now and just look at 2D and 3D elasticity for isotropic, orthotropic and, is and isotropic behavior. And one of, one of the main things to be discussed here is the way in which this orthotropy and anisotropy is defined. For any material, we have a relationship between stress and strain uh, given by this, this relationship here where E is the so-called stiffness matrix. And we also have a relationship between strains and stresses. In this case, it's really, it uses an S matrix, um, so-called compliance matrix. The S matrix will be the inverse of the stiffness and, and vice versa. If the material is 3D, we will have this set of stresses shown here if it's um, and and corresponding strains shown here if it's 2d you will only have sigma x sigma y and the shear stress x y and the the matrix e or s reduces to a three by three matrix depending upon the type of material whether it's anisotropic, orthotropic, or isotropic, this matrix would either be fully populated or partially populated. For orthotropic and isotropic materials, you, many of these terms will be zero. So for example, uh, these, these terms in an orthotropic material, in its, in its principal material directions, these terms will be zero and an isotropic material, they will be zero. Here also zero. These terms will be zero, and these terms will be zero. If it's anisotropic though, this complete matrix will be fully populated. All of these matrices, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, anisotropic, orthotropic or isotropic, they are symmetric. So in this particular case, for anisotropy, we have 21 constants denoted by this upper half here. And you'll see that the, the lower half is symmetric. Perhaps I can just draw something here to help clarify some of this. If we, if we take a simple coupon of material, 
and I'm thinking perhaps of a uh, composite material. So I have fibers in this direction and perhaps fibers in this direction. In this frame, in these fiber frames, the material is orthotropic. However, if I introduce another ply, which is perhaps orientated in this direction, I now have no planes of symmetry and the material behavior becomes anisotropic. anisotropic. That has rather serious disadvantages. For example, if you took a small element of the material and you loaded it, I'm trying to draw forces here, if we load it in this direction and it's anisotropic, it will extend, but it will also shear. And this is a very unfortunate deformation mode for any material. The fact is that you have coupling between extension and shear, or between shear and extension. And that's a consequence of having non-zero terms in, in this region here for the, uh, for the stiffness or the compliance matrix. If we now look at an isotropic material, these simplify greatly compared to the previous anisotropic material. For one thing, the, the material only has two constants. Um, a modulus, a Poisson's ratio. The shear modulus can be determined from these two. So there are only actually two independent material constants. Similarly, if, if, you, if you could only do a test for, let's say, extension modulus E and shear modulus G, then you could get a Poisson's ratio from this relationship. And they're all inter interrelated by this relationship. The compliance matrix is shown here. And as you can see, we have all of these zeros appearing, which prevent any kind of coupling between extension and uh, shear behavior, for example. I'm only showing the uh, compliance relationships here, but um, you, there is a very similar expression or matrix for for stiffness. It just is a little bit more complicated. You can see again the symmetry in the matrix itself. And this um, an, iso an isotropic material has an infinite number of planes of symmetry. In other words, this expression can be used in any orthogonal axis frame in the material. It doesn't matter which axis you, you tend to take. When we're looking at anisotropic materials and orthotropic materials, though that's definitely not the case, and you have to very carefully specify the principal material directions. As usual, at the bottom there, we have that the, uh, the stress is equal to the inverse of the compliance times the strain, which gives us the E matrix. For a 2D material, we have the same sort of relationships. I'm just stating them up here. This is strain against stress. And this is our compliance matrix. Inverting that gives you the stiffness matrix. And I'm showing that relationship down here for stress against strain. So these are our stiffness matrices. These are for two cases. If we have plane stress, it's the one in the center. And if it's plane strain, then the Stiffness matrix, matrix is defined by the relationship shown here at the bottom. This is the compliance matrix relating strains to stresses for an orthotropic material. You see that it has the same structure as an isotropic material, but it only has this structure if it's defined in the principal directions. If, uh, if it's gone through transformations for some other direction, it will be a fully populated matrix. But in the principal directions, it has this structure. 
This means that there is no coupling. Um, so for example, an axial stress will not induce shear strains. That's due to these various zero terms that are present here. There are three independent moduluses for the one, two, and three direction. There are three independent shear moduli for the one, two, two, three, and one, three directions. And there's also a set of uh, Poisson's ratios. The um, requirement that this matrix is symmetric about the diagonal means, for example, that this term here is equal to this term here. This term here is equal to this term here. So we have these relationships shown here. In other words, if you were to do a test and determine E1, E2 in the transverse direction and one of these Poisson's ratios, then the remaining Poisson's ratio is found from this relationship. And it has to be used in order to force the, um, the compliance or the, or the stiffness matrix to be symmetric. As usual, the stiffness is the inverse of this compliance. There are also, um, you, you will find in the literature, um, versions of this matrix for, for stiffness. One of the most important aspects of this is that you have to define the directions of this, of these principal directions, material directions. And I'll be going through this in the next couple of slides. First of all, to show how these directions are defined, and then, and then secondly, to show how various transformations are done in order to convert stresses or strains from one frame to another frame, and also to convert uh, stiffness from one frame to another frame. This shows one of the methods that is used to define these transformation matrices that are used for transforming stiffness or stresses or strains. The example shown at the top here is a, a fiber embedded in a, a resin. The fiber has principal directions one, two, and three. So let's assume that they have, uh, for example, different stiffnesses in each of these three directions. The Cartesian frame is shown here, X, Y, and Z. And then perhaps we have a, a local XL, YL, and ZL frame. The, the XL could be, for example, running in this one direction, the YL in the two direction, and the ZL in the three direction. <clears throat> for the definition of these frames, uh, a code like Calculix, for example, and, and other codes as well, usually have a technique where you can define this point A, shown here, in terms of its position relative to the global XYZ frame. So for example, if, if I defined um, this vector as being 1, 1, 0, it would mean that it runs 1 in the X direction, 1 in the Y direction, and zero in, with respect to the z direction. So it would run at 45 degrees to the x, y axes. That, for example, would give you the position A somewhere on this x direction. I could use any position. It's not important where it is. It's just to, to define the vector. The point B is used to define the y local direction. We could specify it on this, on this axis because we know that this y local is at 90 degrees to the x local. But in fact, we only need to define some point which allows us to define the plane here. And once we get the plane, then we can, we can determine where that point is due to the orthogonality of these two vectors. So two points are necessary, A and B. The Z local direction is automatically computed from the cross product of the X and Y local frame axes. In Calculix, you would define this information by specifying an orientation card 
you would give these two points A and B and then you would link this orientation information to a material group, for example. Other codes have other methods to do it, but basically the ideas are, are the same. The transformation matrix is shown down here. This is used for stresses, strains, and also for stiffness transformation. So it uses direction cosines. L1, M1, and N1 are, for example, the direction cosines of the XL axes with respect to the X, Y, and Z axes. So L1 is just a common term that people use to define this. L1 defines the direction cosine between X and XL. M1 is between Y and YL. And N1 is between Z and XL. Sorry, I hope I said that right. Each, each of these is with respect to this uh, XL axis. And then you have similar direction cosines for the Y local axes. So that's this one relative to the X, Y, and Z. And then this one here would be the Z local shown here with respect to the X, Y, and Z global frames. The transformation relationships for stresses for a second rank second rank tensor are shown at the top here. These expressions here. So this allows us to convert global frame X, Y, Z stresses to local frame one, two, three direction stresses. The tensor, oh, sorry, the transformation T here is the uh, transformation that was shown on the previous slide in terms of L1, M1, and so on. So the global stress matrix is multiplied, pre-multiplied pre by the trans this transformation matrix and post-multiplied by the transpose of it. And to get sigma G in terms of sigma L, it's given by this expression here, where it's pre-multiplied by the transpose and multiplied, multiplied by the post-multiplied by the transformation. You can see one expression of it here for converting global to local stresses. There's another way of expressing this. Um, if you were to multiply all of this out, you'd end up with six equations for sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and the different shear stresses. And those six equations could be, could be listed here. I've actually shown them here. They could be listed here. You'd have a T sigma transformation matrix, which would be six by six. And here you'd have your global vector of stresses, which would be which would be these. This um, transformation matrix T sigma is, is, is important and it's one that would be used for the um, stiffness transformation, which I'll be showing on the next slide. For a 2D material, you only have these stresses in the local frame, these stresses in the global frame, and this T sigma matrix is, is shown here. So in this case, it would be a three by three matrix. Sometimes we don't use the L1, M1 notation. Sometimes we use C and S, where C is the cos squared theta and S is the sine squared theta for the rotation from a, a local to a global frame. That's, that's shown here. The top part of this slide is just quoting or citing the transformation relations for converting global strains to local strains and local strains to global strains.
this uh, T, what's called now T epsilon transformation matrix is given here. I haven't presented it here, but there are also transform uh, T sigma and T epsilon transformation matrices for the full 3D stress systems. These are rather involved six by six matrices. You'll find these in, uh, in various textbooks, for example. These um, T sigma and T epsilon transformations are also used to convert stiffness from one frame to another frame. This can be very important and will be used in, um, in these codes when you're handling orthotropic type materials. The elements are probably formulated in the Cartesian frame or could be formulated in uh, some other local frame system. The material may be defined in a quite different frame system and it can be important to, to, to do a conversion of the stiffness from one frame to another frame so that it agrees with the element frame when working out the element stiffnesses. So transformations are done. Um, they, the, the transformations uh, for stiffness are given here. Basically, if you have this relationship of local stresses to local strains, we usually are able to define this local stiffness, at least for a orthotropic material, this local stiffness is usually easy, easy to define. You can then use these two transformation relationships. If you feed in that the local stresses are equal to T sigma times the global stresses, and the local strains are equal to T epsilon times the global strains. Simply feeding those into this expression here will lead to a relationship between global stresses and global strains. And what's in here is this amount, or rather this amount. So it's the inverse of the T sigma transformation pre-multiplied by the, sorry, it will be the local stiffness pre-multiplied by the T sigma, the inverse of the T sigma transformation and post-multiplied by the strain transformation T epsilon. So this would be our stiffness converted to a global frame. Or if you choose, if you chose uh, different values of the, the angles in these transformations, you could convert it to any other frame. And in a similar way, you can get this uh, transformation for the compliance. I hope that gives a reasonable introduction to elastic material behavior for isotropic, orthotropic and anisotropic materials and, and some introduction at least to the various transformations that might be done if you are handling orthotropic materials. I'm going to move on now and look at nonlinear material behavior. There's only two materials I'm going to focus on. First of all, hyperelasticity, and then a little later I'll move on to plasticity. Normally when we're trying to characterize a material, metals, plastics, composites, we would take a coupon of the material, place it in a testing machine, apply a load, and we'd, we'd look at the relationship between the applied stress and the extension. And this, this would give us the modulus of the material. In an orthotropic material, you might want to test in, in different directions to obtain the different moduli, but essentially the process is exactly the same. In an hyperelastic material, we have very large strains that could be up to 600%, highly nonlinear, and uh, a somewhat different approach has to be done to, has to be used to try and characterize these materials. The text I've, um, I've, I've placed at the top of this slide is an extract from the Calculix manual. It mentions that it uses a potential function which relates the 
stress tensor to the uh, to the strains. And this potential function is uh, in actual fact to get the relationship between stress and strains. You have to dif differentiate this potential function with respect to the strains. This is a somewhat different approach, obviously, to what's used uh, for conventional materials. But I've tried to show that we, we could use this approach even for a conventional material. So for example, if we had a stress strain curve, I plotted it as linear elastic, the stored energy is the area under this curve. So the stored energy would be a half sigma epsilon we can replace sigma with E modulus times strain. So we have a half E epsilon squared. That could be our potential function for this material. If we differentiate U with respect to the strain, we then obtain the stress. So you can see a half E epsilon squared gives us E epsilon. So as I say, the, the, the potential function in this case could be the strain energy, a half E epsilon squared. And, and that's exactly what's used, or in principle, what's used for hyperelastic materials. We have to propose a potential function, which is um, the energy or the strain energy stored in the material. And the relationship between stresses and strains in the material is the differentiation of this function with respect to strain. Just a few basics here, um, properties of hyperelastic materials. As I mentioned already, they can undergo very large strains, even up to 600%. Highly nonlinear behavior. A typical curve is shown in the center of this figure. You have an initial stiff region, and then the molecular structure starts to move the molecules, long chain molecules will stretch and you get this sort of plateau and towards the end you will have a hardening region. The materials themselves are very or more or less incompressible. That means the Poisson's ratio is close to 0.5. There's a relationship there for the bulk modulus if you, if you assume near incompressible behavior. So the volume change of these materials is very small, but they can, they can be easily sheared because they do have a low shear modulus. We don't use the conventional definition of strain for these materials. We, we use uh, so-called stretch ratios. And this is defined at the bottom there and also related to conventional measures of uh, engineering strain. Cauchy strain. The stretch is the length divided by the original length. And you can show it that as, as, as I've uh, shown here, there is a relationship between the stretch and the normal measure of engineering strain. There are several points on this slide that I I just want to mention, first of all, Calculix, like, like most finite element codes that can deal with uh, hyperelastic materials, does have a number of different models implemented. And I've listed them there at the top. And part of the motivation for including this, um, this material type within this presentation is the fact that I used one of these materials. In fact, it was the Ogden model shown here. It was used within um, in, in, in the tutorial in a tutorial in the part two of the book. The other points I've listed there, I think I've already mentioned. The materials themselves are usually treated as isotropic. They are elastic. In other words, unloading follows the loading curve. Highly nonlinear, of course. They're characterized either by stored energy or strain energy functions. And the 
relationship between stress and strain or stretch is obtained by the derivatives of these functions with respect to strain. The models themselves tend to fall into two categories. The, most of them use the expression or the general expression shown here, which involves three invariants. I'll say a word on these invariants in a moment. Each of these invariants is calibrated using a coefficient. And this coefficient, as I say, has to be calibrated against test measurements. There is another model, the Ogden model, which uses, instead of invariance, it uses directly the um, stretch, principal stretch values in the one, two, and three directions. But again, we have to do some calibration against test measurements in order to get uh, a good agreement or some agreement between the model and the test measurements. We have to use large strain or large deformation theory for these materials because the strains are very large and you also have rigid body motions and rotations in the materials going on. So you cannot use the Green-Lagrange definition of strains that I explained in the video on lecture three. A good description or an introduction to this you can find in um, finite strain theory in Wikipedia. It's a good starting point. But one of the essential points of this uh, particular large strain theory is that one of the tensors which uh, describes material deformations is the Green's deformation tensor. This is a diagonal tensor which has principal values sigma or lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared and lambda 3 squared in the diagonal. So they, they represent the eigenvalues of this particular deformation tensor. There are standard expressions to obtain invariance from this tensor. Now I've not gone into this, but the, the three expressions derive these three invariants. So for example, I1 is the trace of the tensor, which is sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, and sigma 3 squared, sorry, lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, and lambda 3 squared, which are, which are the three values in the diagonal of this tensor. There's another expression for the second invariant. The third invariant is the determinant of this tensor, which gives us this expression here. Now these three invariants are simply quantities which do not depend upon axis direction. In other words, if we transform from one axis to another axis, for example, we will always have the same value for the determination of these, these quantities. So they do provide a useful basis to use within models to try and calibrate between test and the, the models themselves. We can incorporate this, this expression here for in, incompressibility into the second invariant. And doing that, we end up with this expression here. So it's quite, quite easy to, to simply uh, replace, for example, this term. Sorry, I should explain that a little bit better. This is set equal to one as the condition for incompressibility. And once it's set equal to one, then for example, this would be one over this quantity. And feeding, feeding that in there would give you one over lambda three squared, for example. So we've reduced the problem from three invariants to two invariants. And then these two invariants would be used to calibrate coefficients between your selected model and your uh, test measurements. Several of the important tests that are used 
for calibrating and measuring and calibrating these material models are shown here. First of all, just to explain some of the some of the notation, the one direction is usually in the transverse direction, the two direction is in the loading direction, and three is the through thickness direction. And you can see some of the uh, typical notation used to define specimen geometry shown there. For the uniaxial tension, we use a very long specimen compared to the other dimensions. The stretch lambda 2 is the change in length divided by the original length. And lambda 1 and lambda 3, which do occur, stretches in the 1 and 3 direction, are 1 divided by the square root of lambda, where lambda is this value here. This, this, these terms here are actually found from the condition of incompressibility, which was shown on the previous slide. The stress in the direction two is the applied load divided by the area of the specimen and sigma one and sigma three in this case are both zero. If you have access to a sophisticated testing machine, a biaxial tension test can be very useful to help calibrate these materials as often they will, they will be exposed to biaxial tension. In that case, you use these cruciform specimens loaded in both directions here and here. Lambda 1 equals lambda 2, assuming you have the same extension in those directions, is equal to lambda, which is the change in length divided by the original length. The original length would be from here to here, of course. Lambda 3, again using incompressibility, you will get that the, the through thickness lambda 3 stretch is 1 divided by lambda squared, where lambda is here. Sigma 1 equals sigma 2 is the applied load divided by the area. So that would be the applied load here divided by the area here. And sigma 3 for a thin specimen would be 0. Rather unusual test is used for shear. It's a planar tension test which uses this specimen here. It's very wide compared to the height and this induces a state of shear within the material. In this particular case, lambda one is equal to one. This means that there is no stretching. The length divided by LO is equal to one and it does not change during the testing. Lambda 2 is the change in length divided by the original length. And again, incompressibility will give us a value for lambda 3. The stresses are given here. And from this information, it's possible to obtain information on the shear stress and shear strain that are, are going on within the material. The idea usually is to um, use a variety of these tests if, if available and to calibrate as best as possible your model against several of these tests. But of course, sometimes you might be wanting to analyze just one particular loading case, in which case you might want to focus on just one particular test. I'm just showing here three popular models that are used for hyperelastic materials. The first is the Mooney-Rivlin model. It involves the first and the second strain invariants. And you can see there the, uh, the coefficients that are used, C10 and C01. These are simply coefficients that are calibrated against test measurements. The nomenclature C10 and C01 Zero one is, 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 is standard. It's used uh, by, by in, 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 in the model definitions and in the various finite element codes. The your model only involves the first strain invariant, not the second. There are usually three coefficients. So you have to calibrate each of these coefficients to, to a, a test.
It's reported to be quite good, except not especially good for low strains. The Ogden model at the bottom there is slightly different. This is usually regarded to be the best of the models. It also has calibration coefficients. These are the, uh, the alpha and the mu terms here, which have to be calibrated. This model is, is somewhat different. It uses um, the principal stretches rather than the strain invariance. But the process for calibration of these parameters is, is very similar. And you can have more terms, usually uh, two or three is used, uh, but you can increase the number of terms for a better fit. This is just to give you some idea of how one of these models is used in practice. I've selected the YOR model. The criteria is given at the top there for this particular model. Three coefficients with only the first strain invariant being used. If we have a simple tension test, then we would have the two invariants given here. This would be the information obtained from a uniaxial extension test. And this would be the, the information from that test in the first and the second strain invariants. Now for this your model, we don't have, uh, it doesn't use the second strain invariance, so we can ignore this in this particular case. The relationship given here is a standard relationship for a uniaxial extension test that gives us engineering stress in terms of strain or stretch. We're using here the differentiation of the, uh, of the strain invariance. And this is general, obtained by Rivlin. You will also find this derived in um, the your model on Wikipedia. So if you don't have access to the Rivlin reference original paper, then, then have a look there. For our your model, though, we can ignore this term. This is not valid for this particular model. So quite simply, you do the differentiation of this, which is here, of this expression, differentiating that with respect to the first strain invariant gives us this relationship. Feeding in our I1 value into that gives us this relationship. <clears throat> and then using that in this relationship gives us the condition relating engineering stress to stretch of the material for a uniaxial test. And this then allows you to calibrate the C10, C20 and C30 to that test. So it's a fairly straightforward process. And this is what you would have to use as input to the, to the finite element code, these, these different coefficients. I've only cited the procedure, the key equations for, for shear. This would be the relationship, the equivalent of the Riblin relationship for shear against stretch. And that would be in, after differentiation of the terms, it would be this expression here. So it's a rather quick overview of hyperelasticity. I'll move on in the next slide to plasticity. First of all, just some basics on uh, plasticity models. If we have a, a simple element with stress sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 applied to three faces, we can separate these stresses into two different types of uh, actions. The first is shown here, which is hydrostatic loading. So this would be an equal stress that is applied to all three faces. It's equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3. And this hydrostatic stress would simply create a change in volume. So it's, it's volumetric deformations causing volumetric strains. The other stresses acting on the faces 
will be, for example, on this face here, it will be sigma 1 or sigma 3 minus sigma 1 divided by 3. And here it would be sigma 3 minus sigma 2 divided by 3. And you'll have similar stresses on these faces and on these faces. These stresses are deviatoric uh, stresses, which, which are stresses which cause shearing of the material. And you can see that if, if you add this one together with this one together with this one, which is, which is this, you'll end up with sigma 3. Similarly, adding this, this, and this together gives you sigma 1. The hydrostatic stresses normally we do not think as having an effect on the plasticity. And it's only the shearing stresses which cause plasticity. Plasticity is the slippage of crystal planes in the uh, microstructure of the of the material. And for metals, that would be slipping of these planes over each other. However, you have to be a little bit careful on this because some materials are influenced or are modeled by plasticity and are influenced by hydrostatic stress. So strictly speaking, for example, the adhesive um, that is modeled in tutorial three of the book I did, I modeled this with a plasticity model. We can, we, it's quite valid to do that. Um, and, and the adhesive being a polymer, it is known that hydrostatic stresses will influence the, um, the yield point of the material. Other materials are, are soils, for example, and there are plasticity models just dedicated to pressure dependent plasticity. But normally for steels, we assume that hydrostatic stresses do not influence the, um, the plasticity or the shearing behavior of the material. Typical stress strain curve is shown here. You have a linear elastic behavior. There is some um, other effects that can take place around here, but normally we simplify things and we just have this curve here up until some point at which breakage occurs. This would be for a very low strain rate. So static, what we would regard as static loading. If you have unloading at any point here, you would come down a curve here. This would be parallel to the original loading curve. And then you have a plastic strain, which would be a state of permanent strain in the material. Any reloading would come back up here. Perhaps you come down to this point and then you reload up here and continue loading. If you have complete unloading, this will be the elastic strain. And if you're involved with dynamic loading of metals, for example, such as uh, in, in car crash or metal stamping, then you will have a viscous effect. In other words, with dynamic loading, the, the plasticity point raises and the hardening curve. This is the hardening curve. This will also be raised with strain rate. Some codes handling these types of materials will, will have um, sophisticated laws to account for this strain rate effect, or possibly you can define these curves for different strain rates and it will use interpolation. The behavior in three dimensions for a, what we what we assume is a, what we often regard as a von Mises plastic behavior is shown by this cylinder. The cylinder extends to infinity in all directions because we assume for a metal we don't have a an effect or an influence from hydrostatic loading. So this cylinder extends. The axis here is um, at 45 degrees to the sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 directions. So any point along this axis is a state of hydrostatic stress. The material is in this state here. And as I mentioned, for a metals, we assume that hydrostatic loading does not influence 
plus this d, so this extends to infinity. The deviatoric stress is the normal to this axis in some direction. Um, and this is the, um, the shearing stresses that cause yielding. And if we have a set of deviatoric stresses that cause us to reach some point on this envelope, then we have plasticity occurring. In other words, for this unidirectional case, we've reached this point here. This um, envelope that's drawn would be the von Mises envelope for the material. It will expand. It will radially, radially increase due to this hardening effect. I shan't be going into the mathematics, um, just giving an introduction. Um, and I will show a, a, a useful reference on this in a moment. But there are basically two criteria that we need to use in handling, uh, mathematically handling plasticity. One is a yielding criteria. There are a number of different criterias. If, you, if you're dealing with um, uh, aluminiums, for example, then you, you, you need perhaps a different criteria. But a typical one for many materials is the von Mises criteria. And this simply states the envelope here. It's a, in, in effect is the li limit of elasticity and in this criteria you can include hardening so this uh, we, we can account for this hardening effect and the increase in the radial direction. The other set of equations that are needed are so-called prandtl royce equations which describe how the plastic flow occurs. In other words if we have a state of stress that brings us outside of this envelope we need a way of moving back towards the envelope um, to, to, to make sure we have a state of, um, uh, that's, that's an equilibrium, if you like. And for that, we use these prandtl royce equations, which I will be, will be briefly showing. I've not derived the von Mises criteria here for yielding. It, it's derived through considerations of the uh, volumetric and the shearing energy that's going on within a material and when basically the shear strain energy reaches a critical value equal to the yield stress then you have plasticity occurring and this critical shear strain energy is given by this expression shown shown here this is termed the effective stress and here we have the yield stress which you would obtain from a coupon test for example so when this minus this is equal to naught, you have yielding occurring. This um, is in principle stresses. You can obtain an equivalent expression in terms of Cartesian or some other stress or, or stresses in some other axis system, which is given here. This, this quantity here is invariant, which means it doesn't change with, with axis system. Very often we express the, um, the relationship between effective stress minus the yield stress. When this is less than zero, we have elasticity. When it's equal to zero, we are on this yield curve. And when it's greater than zero, we're somewhere outside of the yield curve and we have to have some iterative scheme to bring us back to the yield curve. In 2D, the equivalent expression is given here and there will be an equivalent relationship for, uh, for, the, for, the, for stresses in terms of a Cartesian frame. Essentially, we're just setting sigma three equal to zero in this, in this relationship here. If you have a 3D material, you're dealing with a cylinder for the von Mises representation, and the radius of that cylinder is given by this value here. If you're dealing with 2D material, then you take a slice through the, um, through the uh, cylinder, von Mises cylinder, and you end up with something 
it looks like it's an ellipse, an inclined ellipse. The major axis dimension is given here, and the minor axis dimension is given here. So we're talking about this dimension and this dimension. In all of these relations, uh, we account for strain hardening by making this yield stress here a function of plastic strain. So this value will be increasing with plastic strain, at least for a hardening material. You could also have softening materials, perhaps where, where this value will be decreasing with plastic strain, but that's, that's rather unusual. In the next few slides, I just want to point out a few key aspects of these plasticity theories that are used in finite element codes. I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you are interested, there is a, a very good reference there at the top um, based. Uh, that gives a, it gives a good description of the, of the mathematics behind these methods and other methods that are used. It's based largely on the, um, the work of Zinkovich. Um, it's presented also in his book, early books on finite element methods. And there's a number of, and that in itself is based on um, some papers by Zinkovich and Nayak from, from the 1970s, I think. If we, um, if we look at this figure that's down here, perhaps we have two situations. We, we, we assume we're on the yield surface. These techniques are used within an iterative scheme. So let's say we've reached the yield surface. If we have a situation um, due to a load increment where the effective stress is less than the yield stress, this means that you have a state of unloading. In this case, you would use Hooke's law and the uh, elastic modulus in order to unload the structure. It would be a fairly straightforward increment of stresses for, for uh, a given strain increment. If you have um, further loading, then you it's assumed that you move in a normal direction or the stresses increase in a normal direction. Now, this is not possible. It's not allowed. What, what in fact will happen is that you move around this surface to find a set of stresses um, in balance with uh, a set of plastic strains for the applied loading. The increment of stress is given by this, uh, these increments here for three dimensions. Our current stress rate is this amount here. And the increment would be d sigma df, uh, sorry, df d sigma. Now this is explained here, I'll come to it in a second, but times the stress increment. This df d sigma is a vector of all of the differentiation of the yield function with respect to x, the yield function with respect to y, and so on. And it defines the normality vector to the yield surface at this particular state of stress. If you do those differentiations, you end up with these quantities here. 1 over 2 times the effective stress times these values here. If you look back to the uh, expression for effective stress, you will see that uh, that is actually so. So this normality vector times the stress increment, and we, we would start off by assuming it's an elastic stress increment. This amount should actually be equal to zero to maintain, it's a requirement to maintain us on the yield surface. So this is called the consistency requirement. If we now look at strains, during a load increment, we'll have a, a, a strain increment, which will comprise of an elastic part and also a plastic part. Now the elastic part will simply use Hooke's law if, if, this, if this elastic strain occurs. And the plastic part will use these Prandtl-Royce relations, which are shown here. Essentially, it's, it's stating that the increment of the plastic strains is equal to some scaling factor, 
or constant of proportionality multiplied by this vector, which we've seen on the previous slides. This is essentially saying that the strain increments are increasing normal to the surface. Our plastic strain increments, that is. In the previous slide, we were showing that the plastic stresses move tangentially along the surface. And here we're saying that they move normal to the surface. You can think of this as, um, as being like a, uh, a vector, which says basically how the ratios of the different place plastic strains increase. So if we had loading that was predominantly in the x direction, um, then you would have a vector which would be in the x direction, as it were, and the strain contribution in that direction would increase um, more than the other strain increments. Diagrammatically, it's shown here, we'd have a uh, load increment. We get an elastic increment, which might move us in this direction. And then our plastic increment has to move in this direction. This amount plus this amount gives us our total strain. The problem is that in working out um, the actual plastic strain, we have two unknowns in effect. This, um, this quantity here, this vector, depends upon the state of stress, and that's not known. And this, uh, this constant of proportionality is also not known. So this, um, this analysis, as it were, has to be done in an iterative scheme continuously updating d lambda and d sigma, uh, df d sigma. I've um, jumped over some of the mathematics that are used to derive the equation at the top there. It's, it's not particularly difficult and it's been uh, described in the reference I gave you a few slides back. But essentially, you can, you can eliminate this d lambda constant of proportionality by invoking the consistency condition, which I mentioned about three slides ago. And you will then end up with a, after a little bit of mathematics, you will end up with this relationship between the increment of stress and the increment of strain. This then is our elastoplastic matrix, stiffness matrix. This part is the elastic part, and this part is the plastic part. And obviously, uh, this, this has to be tackled using an iterative scheme because this vector dft sigma is not known. We, we, we have to compute update stresses, then we can recompute this term, and it has to be solved within an iterative scheme. In effect, this um, elastoplastic stiffness matrix for the material is used for each of the element stiffnesses. You assemble all the element stiffnesses, and then you have to use a newton raphson scheme in which you will be looking to reduce, minimize the out of balance forces um, for a given applied loading. And in that process, you will be computing elastoplastic stresses and elastoplastic strains. The method is shown in the diagram here. We have a plastic strain, well, we have a plastic strain increment, which will be this multiplied by this, it brings us well outside the surface and the, the plastic stresses minus this amount will bring us back towards the surface. This can't be done in one step. As I say, you have to do this in a number of steps, but essentially the idea is trying to stay on the yield surface, which might also be expanding as you have hardening going on within the, within the material. So it's a rather brief overview. I've only tried to pick out the what I thought were some of the important points for plasti and I hope somehow it's understood. There is the uh, references, as I mentioned, that gives a good description and the, the publications by 
Sienkiewicz and, and Nyack are very are very good at explaining, and they get, they give also a very nice flow diagram on how how these um, computation steps are undertaken. If you do have the book and you're interested, there are three examples of interest, perhaps. Tutorial one, I use elasticity models for orthotropic materials. And there is a, an application and description of how these um, vector directions are defined to, um, to, to, to define the orthotropic axes. In tutorial three, I do a elastoplastic nonlinear analysis of an adhesive bonded lap joint. Plasticity is used for the adhesive. And lastly, on tutorial 11, includes uh, an example of using a hyperelastic material model. In that, in that case, I use the Ogden model. I've, I think I've reasonably covered uh, most of the important points from the book. There is, um, there is perhaps a little bit more of a discussion description given in the book on the Ogden hyperelastic model, which, uh, as I just mentioned, is used in tutorial 11. And in the book, there is also a, a little bit more of a description given on the elastoplastic stiffness matrix and, and how, the, how the solution would be undertaken with these newton raphson schemes. So it's a fairly quick overview. I will be going on in the next tutorial to cover um, installation of codes, a little bit on Calculix and FreeCAD um, and some of the other codes I use. And, and that's basically a precursor before I move on to the, uh, to the tutorials themselves. I should also mention um, I have done in tutorial one and two, which are on the web, YouTube, for example, um, I do include uh, a little bit on the elastoplastic analysis, so maybe that's also of interest to you.